Yeah. Okay. It's loading. Are we live? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so glad that you have joined us on this Facebook Live conversation with Talk on Race School Talk. Um, give me one second. On our Bible Race School Talk, I'm very, very excited about this conversation. And before we begin, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. The Lower Cape Fear YWCA serves the people located within the Lower Cape Fear region. This land once thrived with life from indigenous peoples known today as the Cape Fear Indians and the Waccamaw Sudan Indian people. Living in established settlements along the Cape Fear River and Lake Waccamaw, along with many other established sites in the region, we need to protect and honor the history of these places. Indigenous people are not relics of the past. They are still here continuing to demonstrate their talents and gifts amidst a backdrop of ongoing colonialism and oppression. They are worth celebrating. We hope our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand with us in solidarity with Native nations. The YWCA is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, and freedom and dignity for all. Our hope is that this conversation will stimulate you to open your mind and your heart to diverse thoughts and experiences and encourage you to take action towards peaceful change and racial equity and social justice for our school system. Today, we have an amazing panel here for you. First, I would like to introduce them. Dr. LaShawn Smith is a graduate of UNCW and Fayetteville State University. She is currently the Deputy Superintendent of New Hanover County Schools. Marquise Duncan is a graduate of UNCW. He is currently a fifth and sixth grade English teacher at Friendship Ideal Academy in the District of Columbia. Dr. Sharon Spry Dukes is a graduate of Payne College and the University of South Carolina. She is currently the CEO of the Wide Effect Education Consulting Group and is currently a higher educational professional. Stephanie Adams is a graduate of Bloomsburg University and Eastern University. She is currently a member of the New Hanover County School Board. Davante Howard is a graduate of UNC Pembroke. He is currently a student support specialist with communities and schools at Williston Middle School and here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And he also was the co-chair of Freedom Schools that was hosted this summer. Sabrina Hill Black is a graduate of North Carolina Central University and Garner Webb University. She is currently the illustrious principal of DC Virgo Preparatory Academy. And last but not least, Mr. Nason, Mr. Nelson uh, Bolu is currently a graduate of Mil uh, American Military University and is serving in his first term as a member of the school board of, the, of New Hanover County and is currently also a professor at Cape Fear Community College. Please welcome all of our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Woo, what an introduction. <laughs> I would love to start with, um, if, if you can just briefly tell me what it is that you do. Uh, Dr. Smith, tell us what your role is in the school system and, you know, what do your inner workings are and maybe how um, race influences the decisions that you make. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for that introduction. So as you shared, I am the Deputy Superintendent for New Hanover County Schools. I have been with New Hanover County Schools since 1998, and this is actually my 29th year in, in education. Um, my responsibilities in the district is are around really all things teaching and learning. 
So all the programs that um, are encompassed in our elementary schools, our secondary schools, in our early childhood centers, so our pre-Ks and our in, the, in our Head Start. And so we provide not only academic instruction, but also those additional services. So we provide services to our English learners. We provide services to our students who have been identified as academically gifted as, as, as well. And so for me, in regards to, to race, our, our focus really has been on um, ensuring equity in terms of access and opportunity for all students. Um, within our district, we have some tremendous programs. We have um, the Lyceum at New Hanover High School. We have the IB program at Hoggard High School. We have the Marine Science Academy at Ashley, and we have the STEM um, program at Blaney, just to name just a few. But all children don't have the same level of access to, to those programs. And um, so our work has really been around creating those opportunities um, to make sure that students have that same level of, of access. And then also we see huge disparities across um, our um, higher level courses. So our AP courses and our honors courses when it, when it comes to students of color primarily. Um, and so our work also has been in improving access to those courses. And most of that has been grounded in making sure that students have access in the very earliest of grades to high quality curriculums, high quality teaching, and then we're asking students to engage in high quality learning tasks, which really demand of them that critical thinking um, that's going to help develop them as independent learners early on in, in their school's career. So for us, it really is about improving opportunity and access for all of our students. Thank you so much. And Principal Hill Black, how do you see that, you know, from her being a superintendent and kind of funneling all of that information, how does that help you with education? the teachers and the students? Well, first I'd like to say I've learned a lot from LaShawn. She's actually been one of my mentors. Um, uh -huh. So as a graduate of New Hanover High School, I'm a Wilmingtonian and one of the few who are still here, um, matriculated through many elementary schools, Williston Junior High School at the time and New Hanover High School. So all of my educational background is Wilmington, New Hanover County. Uh -huh. When I decided I was going to be a teacher, um, decided because I was that person who said I was never going to be a teacher. Um, I met Sean and we actually worked together through other, you know, organizations within the school district. And when I became a principal, she was my principal mentor. I met with her every month. Um, I was an instructional coach in the district at one point and she was leading instruction. So er, many of the things that I have learned, I've learned under LaShawn's leadership. Um, so bringing that into a school environment that is still a great partner with New Hanover County Schools has really taught, the, taught us about bridging gaps, one, um, physical gaps when you talk about partnerships, and that everything that's happening in a public education realm is also still required and still happening in charter and in our situation, which is a lab school. Um, we are focused on a higher learning. We're focusing on creating an educational core for our students as early as lower elementary as they matriculate through eighth grade because we want them to also have the same opportunities that are afforded any other a student, child of color or not. When they leave us, our goal is that they have a goal for themselves. Are they going to attend an um, early college program or a specialized program within one of the high schools within New Hanover County? And hopefully those environments will begin to allow them to see themselves in higher ed and know that there is a focus on four year or three year or two year, whatever their expectations are, they can meet them. Um, so I will say I've learned a lot under Dr. Smith um, through her. We still chat. She's grinning because we text each other now. Um, <laughs> um, just knowing that when children, when parents have decided to choose an opportunity such as a lab school, that they're giving us, you know, an opportunity to create brilliance for their children, to create opportunities that sometimes they may not have in other situations. Um, we want excellence. We look at individualized education. We're really taking a look at who our children are what our children deserve and providing them what they can attain to be for the most part. So. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I love DC Virgo. I think y'all are doing an amazing job over there. Um, and so, so Mark, 
Can I, let me just add this. You know, some people don't, we don't really understand what, what DC Virgo is sometimes, but it is a yeah. life and it's, by, it's, it's been designated by legislation that partners with the local school district in which it sits. But our LEA, local education agency, is UNCW. So UNCW is my, my big house, in a sense. It's my school board. And Dean Van Dempsey, by way of Chancellor Sardarelli, acts as our, what we people consider our chancellor for the most part. But based on that legislation, through that partnership with New Hanover County, uh, our teachers still have opportunities for professional development. I have mm -hmm. opportunities as a school leader, child nutrition, at sports, academic competitions, and transportation are huge. And when I, I say I, it's important for us to make people understand that we are a true partner, we, we have great support from New Hanover County. It's not an us versus them. I think we all have the same goals because ultimately our children are going to graduate from a school within New Hanover County. And we want to ensure that we are preparing them for some of the programming and the higher ed, higher opportunity courses that LaShawn is speaking about. So we're, we're changing trajectories is what we're trying to do. Yeah, and, I, and I think that's very important. Um, there's some key things I heard you say, mentorships, relationships, and partnerships. And I think those are some of the things that help um, leadership be strong as a collaboration to come together. And then that translates to teachers, which then translates to the children and seeing that there are always working relationships that are happening around them. So uh, Mr. Duncan, Marquise, how do you see mentorship and relationship important in the classroom? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, being directly in the classroom every day with the students, you get that more face-to-face -face interaction. You get to kind of hear what's going on with them in the class, outside the class. Um, you know, you get to interact and engage with the families. Um, and so I think being the person that they first see in the morning, the last person they see in the evenings going home, um, you have a great opportunity to pour into students. Um, I would say for me, I moved from second grade up to middle school. And it was a big jump for me last year to do that. Um, but my principal was like, hey, I believe what you can bring to the table as a black male and as a mentor can pour into our students for what they may need moving forward, right? Um, and so I think being able to be on the ground, right? Like I know our students will see principals, they'll see people out the building, but they're constantly on the move and on the go. Having the opportunity to directly engage with them will give me a lot more opportunity to just pour into them uh, and kind of set their trajectory, as um, Ms. Black mentioned, to get to the place that we want them to go. Now, uh for the YWCA, we just recently did a 21 day challenge and every day there was some kind of information about race, education, maternal health. Um, we had all of these different things, but there's one article um, that said black students who had just one black teacher by third grade are 13% more likely to go to college. If they have two black teachers by third grade, they are 32% more likely to attend college. So um, with students seeing teachers, principals, superintendents of color, what, how does that translate to our school district to continue to make sure that our students are not just graduating high school, but that they are moving forward for a higher education? And anybody can answer that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, as, as you know, uh, New Hanover County recently hired our first black superintendent. Um, uh, and that was, I think that's a moment everybody should should be proud of. Um, and it needs to be a moment that everybody looks at as a first step because you have to see it to be it. A friend of mine always tells me, you gotta see it to be it. Um, our young black students need to see uh, black people in positions of authority, in positions of power. They need to see their teachers, their principals as people who can be just like them. Um, and I think it's critical that we as a district adopt that attitude and that understanding of, you know, realizing we don't live in a colorblind society, uh, race matters. And we have to talk about that and we have to make sure that that is a part of what influences our decision making. Yes, yes. And Marquise, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was gonna piggyback off that. Yeah, like, you know, the representation thing matters. You know, America believes in a meritocracy, right? We believe that education is transcendent, right? That if children go through, they get the education they need, it can change social classes, right? It, it can literally transcend their lives and their families' lives. 
And so I think if you're asking children to learn from people that they can't see themselves reflected, well, this person's telling me to be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go be this, go be that. But I can't see that reflected, right? I can't see that around me. And so representation is critical and crucial because yeah, Mr. Duncan says, you can go be this, you can go do that. Well, it might make a little more of a connection to me because I can see myself in Mr. Duncan just like he can see himself in me. And so, yeah, like if we're talking about education is transcendent, they have to be able to see themselves somewhere else like Mr. Boo said, so they can see that path there to get there. Absolutely. And I think, Dr. Dukes, I think your consulting firm kind of addresses some of these things. So can you tell us a little bit more about the right effect and how we how it really could influence and help students of color and give them the confidence and maybe the goals of, you know, attaining a higher education degree? Um, well, Okay, I'm going to take this in two two parts, okay? <laughs> Devontae said this earlier. I may talk fast, so I'm going to try to slow it down. <laughs> um, so with the right effect, the biggest push was trying to create student affairs programs for K through 12. So having a background in student affairs, being very active um, on, co on a college campus, I realized that once I started working in the um, high school sector, it wasn't the same atmosphere. So whereas right now I'm in a building of 50 people on staff to strictly cater to extracurricular activities, when you go to the high school, you'll see people doing dual roles. So I'm a teacher, I'm the mentor, I'm the coach, I'm the advisor of the club, and it's just a lot to try to put in on one person. So right if it tries to break those systems down and create an organization that um, the teachers can feel like they're really being empowered in what they're doing and not overwhelmed. Um, but also that you're really in trying to encourage school systems to um, put more money and effort towards those areas. It's, it's, I call it the part of the school that doesn't get as much seasoning as marinating as everything else. It's like classroom, classroom. But I was that kid that I really liked the dance class. I like Spanish club, you know, all those other things. So that's what we really try to work towards. And when you look at um, representation and race, um, all black, all black teachers, all black students, they saw us, but they didn't see the people in the career fields that they wanted to go into being black. So using that extracurricular time to say, okay, something as simple, you want to be a surgeon, I need to find a black surgeon in Augusta area to come talk to you guys. And we need to kind of open up that space to see the careers they want to, because sometimes with us, we become mom and dad. We're they don't want to listen to us. It's like, oh, okay, Dr. Duke said go to school. That's great. But I want to talk to somebody who's actually in the field that I'm working in that looks like me, um, may have had the same background as me. And that's what that extracurricular and right effect tries to see how to work those spaces within the school day. So it doesn't disrupt academics, but it becomes complementary to it. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. I was much. just going to add um, the fact that to see it, be it, you also have to have opportunities to see it because oftentimes we, we negate the fact that we're not providing the opportunity for children, as Dr. Dukes mentioned, to see what they want to be. Um, we think about school sometimes within the four walls of the school, but we have to remove our children from this environment, the four wall, the brick and mortar, to see themselves on a college campus, to visit a college campus as early as early elementary school. And we can see ourselves on a college campus if we've been immersed there at an early age. And we can see ourselves even at the community college downstairs in that trade or that program, because oftentimes there are children who see, they emulate. Think about little boys, guys. When they play with cars, they are playing with cars. They are tearing those cars apart. Let's take that energy and use that and force them into some of those classes that are going to be required to continue that education, to be able to do that later. Um, I spoke to someone just a couple of weeks ago about opportunity. Growing up here in Wilmington, I can tell you how many black teachers I had from kindergarten through high school and through Sunday school. I could be it because I saw it and there was that influence. Um, but also taking our children out of our environment into other colleges, into other schools, even from one high school to another, to look at different programming that may be there within those schools for them that they could just you know, own and say, this is for me and I want to be there. But also teaching them to self-advocate for themselves because oftentimes as educators, we advocate for them and use their voice instead of allowing them to use their voice to say, this is really what I want to do. This is who I want to be. And providing opportunities for nonprofits and organizations to, to mentor, going back to the mentor piece. Once children realize, hmm, this person is really cool and they are a police officer. 
I can see myself being a police officer. Um, or they see our police chief. Hmm, he grew up where I grew up. I can be the chief of police in Wilmington. Um, or, you know, if they want to be an esthetician, do hair. Show them that this is the way to create that business and taking them to the opportunities instead of always thinking the opportunity has to come to them in a brick and mortar environment. The influence is overwhelming and we can really be a powerful influence. And if I can add to that too, um, I, I started my career in Philadelphia public schools and my students didn't look like me in every building that I worked in. So I felt as a white educator, it was my job when they said to me, I can't do that job. Nobody from my block does that job. I went out and I, although I couldn't represent what they looked like, I found people to speak to my students. What Ms. Hill Black said, I took them out into the community. I let them get to the jobs. I um, would snip as many newspaper clippings as possible. So the next time if a student said to me, I can't do that, nobody does that where I'm from. Oh, wait, please look up here what I've got hanging here. He grew up around the corner from you. You can't tell me you can't do that. So being able to make that connection as a white educator is so important. And I may not be able to see the world from your experience, but I can do what I can to ex help you expand your experiences as much as possible because it's on us as well too. Yeah. Also add to that just a little bit. I think it's as the chief academic officer for the district, it's so important for our children to show up in the curriculum that we put in front of them. Um, that was not my experience um, as a young person in going through school, nor my experience in, in college. And it, so it shouldn't be that we learn about black people only only when we take an African American studies course. Um, we have to, to, to acknowledge the fact that black history didn't just simply be, begin with, with, with slavery. Um, and also I'll share this, um, and Ms. Adams, you might wanna talk about the work that you're doing with us with, within the district. Um, just in bringing to our classroom books that are written about black children, about black people and by African-American authors. And right now we're working with our teachers and also um, Ms. Adams is working with the group to help fund um, enhancing our the diversity in our classroom libraries as well as our media centers. And I don't know if you wanna to speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, the coronavirus and COVID and reopening of schools has kind of pushed that back a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I had asked Dr. Smith one day, do we have represent, rep, all of our students, are they being represented in our libraries? And when we got into that conversation, the answer was no. And, and so I said, well, what can we do? So she went out to the teachers and she, I had a list of thousands of books very quickly that educators were recommending um, that they would like to see in our libraries. And so it's definitely, um, that, that's one of the goals for this year is, is I'd love to see, I know fundraising is a tough time right now, but being able to work with our community to help outfit our libraries with literature that reflects our students, all of our students, um, because it, representation matters. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Howard. Uh, definitely. Uh, funny enough, I think um, when it especially came to this uh, brief, the brief break that we did have within our duration of Freedom Schools, that definitely was a good like that was, that was definitely a nice shining light to the community. Of course, with the, sem the semester in so well, not semester, but the quarters in so abruptly because of COVID, uh, we of course we said that the safety, the right safety pre uh, precautions to make sure we had COVID under control when it comes to. How we, how we facilitated freedom schools, but it was amazing. Uh, of course, and the, the kids, the kids we did have were a lot from the community, and they they weren't they weren't they were definitely not used to hearing about the conversation we did have versus um, the stuff they normally been hearing. Like um, I think the uh, the thing that we had this year for our freedom school was really about voting, and then I think the kids, whether they're from second grade to my middle school, going into high school grades, they see the importance of voting again. What does it mean to have financial literacy and what does it mean to have all these other like afrocentric ideas that they were not taught throughout the school which i thought was really impactful definitely uh, lucky for me i had um i think I, like i mentioned earlier I, like um, me working at williston i had one williston kid that um now my, our, our relationship has got a lot stronger now because our freedom school connection before he didn't know what he really wanted to do with his life and this is and this and uh with me coordinate with me doing a brief little coordination with the step he was like oh like why do you step? Like, what's the importance of stepping to you? So I asked, I asked the person him, like, what's fraternity sorority life? Uh, what is college, and what does that look like? And what, like, how did I get involved into that? And even some of the guest speakers we did have the community, the community leaders, whether it was um, Reverend Dr. Palmer coming in or Big B, who are from, you know, basically from homes and communities that they're from, 
reflected them like, oh, they did it, I can do it too. So it was really impactful to see that. So yeah, it was a little time in, sorry. Yes, no, and I enjoyed um, Freedom Schools. I, I think there was like, uh, when you were stepping, they taught kids how to spell words in the middle of the step. And so I, I enjoyed um, watching the innovation of merging education with music and culture. And I think that all of those things are important. Um, we do have a question. Uh, I believe this is for Principal Hill Black. You talked about self-advocacy and teaching uh, the students how to advocate for themselves. So how can parents and educators help teach and encourage kids to have their own opinion? I think it just starts with us sometimes taking off the parent and the teacher shirt and seeing our students as human first because our children have vast imaginations. They are very um, influenced sometimes by the right and sometimes by the wrong and just listening, opening our ears and listening to children and hearing them, really hearing them for what they're asking and giving them honest answers. Sometimes it may mean as a parent, you have to have a conversation you weren't quite prepared to have at the time and at that age. But it, it honesty, I think will be the best because as a parent, you would rather have that, honor, that honest conversation, drive the conversation yourself with the morals and the values that you are imposing upon your child as the parent and as the family unit, rather than the outside influence. Um, what we ask teachers to do is also be open, especially during times of COVID. Since school has ended, when school ended in March and all of the things that have happened in the community, we've asked our teachers to brace yourselves. Children are going to come back with questions and they are going to shoot questions at you that you may not have ever thought you were going to be prepared to answer. They've heard and they've read and they felt the, the racial Im impact of what's happened around George Floyd. They've seen that, you know, we've lost great leaders. They are seeing things happening in their community, in their neighborhood, in, in their homes, and they're going to ask. So during a morning meeting and during that time of um, social emotional learning lessons that are going to occur as we move into a virtual world, if parents can have conversations with the about the questions that we're going to pose with children, I think it's going to open many doors. Um, I think Janiqua already said it. Those of you who know me, I'm at DC Virgo all the time. I'm out there in the morning. <laughs> Devontae's laughing. I'm out there in the afternoon. You have my cell phone number. People know how to find Ms. Hill Black. If it's something you want to know or you have a question or something we can help guide you with, with especially as a family unit, let us know. If we can't find it, we have many community organizations who are asking, how can I help? How can I help? And maybe it's a matter of roundtable talks. There, there sometimes as parents, we don't know the answer. We don't know how to guide our children in that. And, and that's okay. It's, it's a part of parenting. I'm still learning. I have a 21 year old. Um, so you know, we, we know, um, self-advocate, let your children know that it is okay. Sometimes we have to remind adults that self-advocacy is not rudeness and children aren't being rude and they're not being disrespectful, you know, as the old people, the older generation, older, may, older. older generation may say, you know, they are simply, asking a question. This is a new generation. And when we think about generational gaps and how some of us were raised two or three generations ago, our children are, it's, it's 2020, 2021. They have been exposed to all the things that we were um, coddled from for the most part and things that we weren't supposed to know and hear. They are hearing them at an early age. So we have to require or allow ourselves to be open and be honest with our family, with our children, especially home and school. Now, sometimes there's a fine line between what a teacher can say and what a teacher can do. But if you build community and have a great relationship with families of the children you teach, I think there's there's also opportunity to have those good conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. And speaking of George Floyd and a lot of the racial unrest that we have experienced, how has this influenced, and maybe this question is more for Stephanie and Nelson, how has this influenced New Hanover County School Board and supporting racial equity and supporting teachers having these types of tough conversations? What are some of the things that the school board is thinking through? And uh, you know, what is that conversation looking like? Nelson, do you want me to take that one? Um, yeah, so about a year ago, uh, we started the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, and it was an outgrowth of a 
homegrown um, work work group that started talking about equity within the district. And the role of that EDI committee is to talk about policies and procedures that need to be put into place. When we talk about equity, we talk about race, we talk about LGBTQ, we talk about disabilities. And, and so what are we doing to address? Um, definitely since uh, George Floyd's murder, I would say a large portion of our conversations have been around race. And they've been some really tough conversations in that room, um, very emotional. Um, it's a very diverse group made up of community, New Hanover County Schools employees and board members. And um, we're moving forward. We are addressing the conversations. What Ms. Hill Black said, you know, we expect that our students are coming back with conversations. I've had conversations with my eight-year-old around race and, and Black Lives Matter and, and questions that he comes up with sometimes shock me. And, and um, being able to arm our teachers with how to respond to those is gonna be really important. Um, from a policy perspective, and if, if Dr. Smith wants to jump in on some of this too, um, we've really been working on training. We've talked a lot about implicit bias. Our teachers have gone through implicit bias training. We're looking at, um, as she mentioned earlier, AP classes. Um, how, are we, how are we making sure that in our special programs and in um, certain areas, are we being equitable? Um, does, our, does our student population represent in those classes our actual student population as a district? Um, so we're looking at that data. We're looking at suspension data uh, because we know that our suspension rates, particularly for our black males, are incredibly high in comparison mm -hmm. to the rest of our students. And we need to figure out why that is. And we have to have some real honest conversations with ourselves as educators. And as, as, as a white educator, I think it's important that we need to not be afraid to have those difficult conversations. Um, we have to understand that we all have bias. We have to believe that we have racist thoughts and we have to acknowledge that. And because you have a racist thought doesn't make you a bad person but you need to acknowledge where it's coming from, ask yourself why it is coming from that. And we need to be able to have that conversation with ourselves and create a safe space for our educators of all colors in New Hanover County schools to be able to have that conversation. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, uh, my first introduction actually to Dr. Smith was at the groundwater training uh -huh. with the Racial uh, Equity Institute. And um, Lavo Bank sponsored um, me to go. And um, I sat in the training like, right? Wow. <laughs> like these stats and statistics that are, that they were mind blowing. They were sad. And, you know, um, the fact that New Hanover, New Hanover County Schools was sponsoring the conversation said to me that our county realizes that uh, racial inequities exist. They exist within our systems, but that, that we want to do something about it. And the first place we have to start is educating ourselves on what is happening. And so Dr. Smith, thank you for organizing uh, that training. It was, I think I was upset when I left because I just didn't know what to do with it didn't know where to go with it. Um, and so maybe leading into that, you know, why did you choose that particular training for our county? And um, yeah, what what did you almost expect us to do with it? Maybe, I think that's a hard question, but. <laughs> so we're not done. Um, yeah, definitely COVID-19 has interrupted the, the path that we had laid in front of us, but um, you know, but we're going to choose to either go through that mountain or, or to go over it. We're we're, we're not going to stop. And so, what I'll say is, that it's a part of our our strategy. And um, you know, I'm I'm very much, um, or I'd like to think of myself as a very strategic and intentional person. And so, what we do um, does not happen by chance. Um, it happens by in, in, intention. Um, and, um, and, and we're very much designed um, toward a specific out, uh, um, impact in, in our community. And so we realized very early that New Hanover County system sits within a community. And so we in of, our, of ourselves are a community of about 30,000. So we have about 26,000 children and about 4,000 employees. So we're a community of 30,000, but we sit in a larger community. And that larger community is New Hanover County. And there are about 250,000 people in New Hanover. So if we want to change the trajectory, just as Ms. Hill Black said, of our children, we have to impact 
not only what happens in our schools, but we have to impact what happens in our community as a, as a, as a whole, the larger community, which is New Hanover County. And so part of our strategy is not only to educate ourselves, and I appreciate the fact that you have recognized our strategy without me even speaking to it. So we are investing in experts and we are leaning in on the learning. Um, but also we have to embrace and engage with the community to change the narrative. So if the community believes one thing um, and we want them to believe something different, then we have to engage with them and to, to change the narrative. And first, that means that we have to be part in partnership in, with this. So not only in that room were there are members of the community, but there were members of the school system. And so in educating ourselves, we need to understand where this originated. And if you remember the, the metaphor, the allegory that they use in groundwater, understanding that so much of what we do just simply focuses on the fish you know so we focus on the individual but the individual is not the system we have to focus on the system and then once we have focused on the system we have to focus on what feeds the system and what feeds the system is the groundwater and so our work really is not only about educational inequities but they're about the disparities that we find in healthcare, the disparities that we find in our criminal justice system the disparities that we find in our banking systems, in our um, in employment systems, um, all those pieces. And only when we come together as a community and say no more, shall we see the change that we truly want to see for every member of our community. I don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> but I mean, Thank you. I appreciate you being there and I appreciate the impact that it's that it's had. And I'm sure you've had many conversations with many folks as a result of it. But just know we are not done. Yeah, absolutely. And, I've and definitely... I would like to say, oh, yes, please. Dr. Smith has been driving this work in this community and um, she is, is very humble about it. Um, but she has been the backbone of these conversations around equity in New Hanover County Schools. And I just want to say that, you know, she's done an amazing job. And like she said, we're going to keep moving and we're pushing forward. Yes. And as we're moving forward and pushing forward, what does what does it look like? What what is how do we know when we've gotten there? Like, what is the fruit of that education system? So. Um, my perspective, what it looks like is when the, there aren't the disparities that we're seeing right now. So we're just seeing disparities in our student outcomes, as I mentioned to you before, disparities in the enrollment of um, students in advanced level of courses. And then also, you know, you, you, you spoke to, um, I think, Ms. Adams, the disparities in the, um, when it comes to student discipline. So when those are no more. So when students of color, people of color, people of differing, varying backgrounds are represented equally in positions of, of power and authority within our community as a whole. When that is the, the case, then what I would say to you, um, our work is it's done. We want to make sure just as we acknowledge um, that racism is institutionalized, we want to make sure that um, adopting a anti-racist um, attitude um, is, is becomes institutionalized um, as well. So moving completely in the opposite direction. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, I, I would say that those are the goals of the ones uh, Dr. Smith mentioned. Um, I, I think it's a nice idea to say, well, this is, you know, this is the end point. I think once you reach those goals, there are new goals. And I feel like it's it's like that old saying about, you know, uh, the Brahmin in, the, in Hinduism. You know, if you think you know Brahmin, uh, you don't know. But when you realize you don't know, that is when you truly know. I feel like once we get to that point uh, that, that Dr. Smith is talking about, there's more to do then. Um, so I, I don't think the work ever ends. Um, I, I don't, and I don't really think that that's a negative um, because there's always going to be different streams that open up once you, you know, keep, keep building the canal. There's always going to be different uh, pieces that you have to fill. And Mr. Duncan, being that you are in the classroom, what does that look like as a teacher? You know, what does, 
the equity look like in the classroom? And is it challenging in the classroom to make sure that, you know, I, I'm not sure about the diversity in your particular classroom, but, you know, do you see those types of disparities and challenges? And then what is what is your hope while you're working through them? Yeah, uh, most definitely. So um, I have not taught a, a vastly diverse um, group of kids over the last few years, um, Black and Latino students, so we're doing students of color. But as an English teacher, what that means for me is putting things in front of them, right? If it's a book on Sonia Sotomayor for my Latina student who needs to see herself represented, I bring a Sonia Sotomayor book stand, right? If it's if it's books on, you know, oh, blah, 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 I like to do football. Okay, well, let's get this Jerry Rice book, right? This nonfiction text. Let's read about his story, right? So putting things in front of them where they can see themselves is difficult. Right, I think um, Dr. Smith mentioned things about equitable curriculum, right? So being a teacher, you don't always get complete autonomy of what you can do, but um, <laughs> with, with what I've been given, I do my best to make it work. So I'll give an example. Uh, my sixth grade students, the first module is the Great Depression and Resilience, right? The lead text is Bud Not Buddy, which has a Black man character um, and talks about his, his plight through the experience. All of the activities that came along with the curriculum were videos of like white people with dusty faces and sad losing their homes. Um, you know, it was, it did not fit what they could see, right? So I had to twist and turn that. And, you know, I went to my coach, like, hey, can I move these pieces? Can I change this? Can I add this, right? Make sure I, I, I got it confirmed. But it was, now let's show you video and give you the reality, right? I think, like, um, uh, like I said, right, you have to draw those conversations, right? Kids are going to have questions. They're going to be wondering, like, why is this happening? Why do I see myself within it? Let them know. So I did tell them, hey, during the Great Depression, yeah, everybody had it bad, but there were times in which Black people were getting fired for white people, right? There were times in which Hooverville and shanty towns, but Black people were living in those before the Great Depression and after, right? And so making sure they understand those things, um, it is difficult. It is difficult, but doing my best to integrate everything that I possibly can so they can understand equity in that way. I think what he speaks to, I think what he speaks to is the opportunity to allow teachers to have a little autonomy and doing what they need to do for the children who sit before them in their seats. To take a book like Bud Not Buddy and you having the, the talent and the skill to use that instructional core to make it relevant for your students is powerful. So as principals and leaders and coaches, giving you that, that opportunity to ensure that your curriculum is equitable outside of the packaged curriculum is powerful in, its, in its so many ways because it says that at, starting with some Dr. Smith at the top who allows that opportunity for principals to allow autonomy for you to be able to provide that is powerful because you know those students who are sitting in front of you every day. Same thing can happen in math lessons to make it relevant. When a student is learning Pythagorean theorem, you know, they may need to get out there and envision a, a wire going from one pole to another pole and a wire going from the pole to the ground in order to get the hypotenuse to determine how much wiring happens. And then what if, I, what if the wire you know, catches on fire? You know, also teaching the science lesson there because when they are inquisitive and they want to know how this is relevant in their core, the teacher has to have the ability, um, the know-how and the opportunity provided to them to make that curriculum relevant to the students in front of them. So that is powerful in itself that one, you ask the question, may I? And two, you took charge in knowing that this was not going to be relevant for my students. I have to make it that way. So that happened, that has to happen in, in classrooms. Teachers have to know that they are empowered to know that the curriculum they need to teach for their students and how to manipulate that curriculum to make it equitable. Because if we constantly wait for a package program, you're not going to see the equity in it at all. Um, but you have to also read the literature. You have to know the curriculum. You have to know the history and to be able to provide it from a, your lens into their lens so that it is accessible to all. So, thank you, yeah. buddy. <laughs> I, I was going to add this to um, Janiqua, uh, two things. Um, I enjoyed being able to work with things outside of the classroom, but collaborate with teachers to make it a whole curriculum for the school. So, um, it, and it kind of came... Uh, Unexpectedly, I was doing a, a lesson on historically black colleges using the PBS special, um, Tell Them We Are Rising. So in, initially the um, Langston Hughes poem was being read and a student was like, oh, we just did that in literature. So I'm like, oh, really? Okay, so let, let me go talk to your literature teacher and tie this all together. And it, and it ended up expanding into, um, we decided to do a talented 10th portion of the, um, for the, every kid that was in the extracurricular activity, if it was a sport, cheerleading band, 
a club that you in your history class and your literature class, we're going to tie in the concept of the talented 10th and then do a conference for all of you guys throughout the school day. So it kind of gives you um, from all aspects. It's not just pocketed in the classroom. Like my coach came in here and talked to me about it. Then my guidance counselor talked to me about it. So I'm getting a whole student perspective. Um, and the biggest thing I've always seen with teachers trying to find that autonomy to do that is like you said, um, of being empowered, but also creating a school environment that that can happen in. Because I've worked in schools where the idea of going outside is impossible. We we're dealing with heavy discipline issues and gangs and activities where we have to figure out how to get that culture changed first so that the teachers can feel like I can, I can be more flexible in my curriculum. And then students will be more engaged with what we're doing. So I, I've always sympathized with teachers who are like, I really want to do this, but I don't, like, I'm running into problems. As soon as I walked in the hallway, it was a fight. Y'all put us on lockdown. And I, <laughs> so it's like, you know, going from a school where, hey, we can go do whatever we want to, to no, everybody has to do this. Um, I realize that the culture has to change. The culture of your school is, is so important, whether you are advocating for diversity and inclusion or you're just advocating for um, morals and ethics and empowerment and advocacy, that those things have to be in place so that the teacher can say, hey, I have the space and the um, environment to do these things for our students. Absolutely. And Mr. Howard, how does that then translate to your role as a support role to support the teachers, the principals, the families? How does that, you know, translate for you with communities uh, and schools? Definitely. Uh, we play a much, we play such a major role. Um, funny enough, I think uh, when I was doing elementary school level, I didn't see the importance of it really like that until I got to the middle school level and come into that, the, like the, that Wilson community, which come from many different walks of life, um, you know, whether, you know, um, single parent households, gang activity, um, disparity, other disparities, stuff like that as well. But um, definitely with the teachers, um, as, well, I, of course, I, I, like to, I love to definitely put myself in the roles of um, especially more benefit for the kids. Definitely moving forward, kind of. I don't know. When I was their age, I was that kid who felt like they couldn't speak, uh, speak, who can out, be out, too outspoken, who had to pull it back, who can't be too this, 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 or this, or this, or this and that. But definitely with that, uh, with that, it's really um, amazing to be able to play that role to where we can advocate on behalf of the kids, but also with the kids, let them know like, hey, maybe your teacher is right about this certain situation, or to change your your insight about this regarding uh, your behavior or the way you talk or the way you carry yourself. And now I know with us having so much change within the school, um, I know our role is always improving, definitely. Um, even now with COVID, you know, we um, we still try to work up through some barriers of that. However, um, sometimes it really does, it really does mean a lot knowing that my kid can, a kid, one of my kids can be like, hey, Mr. Howard, like, you know, I know I can't see you, but the fact that I can send you an email or we can do office hours together virtually because I don't understand this math or this social studies or this literature, it, go, it does mean a lot. And also, too, just, you know, it's also just about, you know, just making the team a lot better. Um, and we all don't have to be LeBron James on the team, but it's okay to be a Kyle Kuzma or a nice little additional <laughs> player to add more to the, uh, the flair and the dynamic of the team. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe this is a good question for Principal Hillblack. As you are hiring teachers and as you are looking across the spectrum to, to make sure that you are creating this culture, what do you look for in, in those that you are hiring? Is there like a spark? Is there, is it, you know, that they went to HBCU? Is it, you know, can you just feel their passion? What are some of the things that you look for to kind of help bring people on board to create that type of culture? Um, so typically in a typical school district, you have a lot of um, face time with candidates. The university world hiring process is a little different. So I actually do get to interview after they've gone through a few steps um, and kind of help make the final decision. A couple of the questions that we always ask them are about um, diversity experience in education, K-12. We also ask about their thoughts on restorative justice um, and if they have used any models of restorative justice, if they are, um, if they have, can you explain some to us? How have you worked or taught SEL, social emotional learning in your classes? And um, just give us their experience in working what in what they consider a Title I school. So after hearing that question, we also you know try to delve in just to a little bit because Title I schools are different depending on where you are in a city, a county, or a part of the state. So we also ask them to teach a lesson. 
And in that lesson, during that interview, we really take a look at not only just um, the presentation of the instruction, but what the instruction is, what materials they are using, which core standards, and how they are integrating other standards into that lesson. Um, Pre-COVID, we had them come in and do it face-to-face -face, um, with a small group. During COVID, it was very, it's been very interesting. We've actually seen a few lessons in a COVID world on a Zoom without children. So very interesting. Um, but we do want to know, we want to know those questions and ask those questions. We are such a small staff. We don't do you know, too much hiring over and over again, but we've had to. And we also want to take a look at their experience with um, all children, regardless of color, regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic background. How well do you get along with children? And a big question we always ask at the very end is what's their relationship with the local school community? Um, do they have a relationship with the local school community? If not, are you willing? And what would that look like in your class? You know, you've been here. Our classroom doors are open most of the time. You can see teachers. You can talk to teachers. And community is big for us. We sit in a community that has been impacted by, by race, by the, you know, racial inequity, racial injustice, all back to, you know, history of 1898. And we want our children to know and understand that and continue to move, as LaShawn said, through it you know, um, and have those good conversations. It, it's difficult sometimes with younger children, but we begin to talk about treating people fairly and being nice and what that means and what that looks like on a whole, starting the conversation early. So we want candidates to know that these are conversations we're having. When the school opened three years ago, the first book study was Cape Fear Rising. We need you to know and understand where you work um, that this school sits directly in the middle of a community that was impacted by everything that happened around the racial equities in 1898 and some of the history of Wilmington in itself. There are numerous book studies that have happened. One of the last ones we actually completed, I'm going to throw a plug to Bettina Love. If you have not read Bettina Love's and you know how to be an abolitionist teacher, it was one of the last book studies we did with over half the staff. Um, the next one that we're going to do is Cornelius Miners. I know LaShawn knows that one. Um, we got this, and Dr. Dukes may know that one as well. And there are other conversations about other book studies we're doing, and these are school-wide. Um, so a goal is to bring families and parents into some of these conversations as well. We have a very small PTA, but I think we're going to have some great new PTA leadership members. I think one might be sitting on the call who's going to help us bridge and bring in some community <laughs> members to have conversations. Um, because we need, it's a must. We have to. We, we you know, a wonderful group of family advocates who advocate for not only their children, but for children throughout New Hanover County. And it's time to continue to have the conversations locally, you know, on a bigger level and in a place that people are comfortable. We're not afraid to have those conversations here. We're small, but we're, we're ready to work and continue to through it. So. Absolutely. So our closing question will be for everyone. Um, your final thoughts and things that you would like to leave with the community about the work that you do, your passion, and what drives you to, you know, be on the board, what drives you to stay in this position and wake up every day and continue to do some of this work, because it's not easy, you know, um, the decisions sometimes that have to be made are between a rock and a hard place. Um, but what keeps you going, what keeps you motivated, and then any final thoughts you will have. So we'll start with Dr. Smith. Let me unmute myself. Um, what I would say in, in the bio that I sent to you, I think one of the first things that I listed was that I was a mother. And um, so I'm a mother of um, two living African American males. And so what I would say to you is that when I wake up every morning, those two boys are on my mind. One is 20 years of age and has unfortunately experienced racism within our community being profiled by the local police department. Um, and then my youngest is um, 10 years old. And so they are with me all the time. And I know that the work that I do is not only helping them, but also helping other children that look like them. And that if I can work with our community to figure this out, then it does nothing but help every child in our community, regardless of race, regardless of sex, regardless of social and social economic status. Um, and so that is what drives me. This is important work. Um, I can't think of anything that I would um, 
prefer to do. Um, I have a passion for it. I'm surrounded by dedicated, committed, um, unbelievable people that I am blessed to work with every day. Um, and so it, it, this is, it, I can't think of anything that would be much any more fulfilling than the work that we do. And then also to um, our board, I have to say that we have an extremely supportive board um, that have, they, they have not only stood um, with us in this work, but they have also stood in front of us in this work um, and, 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 and made a way for this work. And so I definitely commend and celebrate them um, as well. I know it has not been easy um, for them, um, but um, in all things, I know it has not been easy but um, I can't imagine doing anything else. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Howard. Um, a good question. Uh, funny enough, I, a couple weeks ago, I was reading this book called Between the World and Me. Um, I, a bit of a reflection. I remember that like um, Tennessee Coates, he was saying how he, uh, how his father explained to him, how like, how, like metaphorically, you know, your body was a little, you know, the metaphor was like um, basically saying like, if your body, you know, body have like two legs. So one leg, the school system has your legs on one side and it's pulling you back and you have the street life pulling you back. Like where's it in between that? Like where is that level of growth or that level of exposure that you need to get you to that next level? And uh, of course, I mean, I don't really have an education background yet. Well, actually, I'm more so I'm evolving to a more now definitely in a more community outreach and stuff, definitely. But I definitely love, I definitely love being a part of that support system, whether it's just me telling kids good morning, or a former kid about HBCUs, or or even like Native American schools, or other di other different levels of schools or education that really can definitely impact them and give them the exposure they need to go forward. Um, of course, you know, um, sometimes life doesn't have, sometimes life doesn't have to be black and white. Like we do, like we deserve to have a nice little gold in there, a nice little shade of red or blue or green or prosperity and everything. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm pink. I'm pink, a nice color, you know. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Howard. Mr. Duncan. Um, yeah, so my background is actually in sociology. Um, and so um, going to school in the area of technology with race, class, and gender. So coming into the classroom, I was very much aware of the role I played as a Black male teacher um, because that is the minority in the education field. Um, and so I understood what it meant also and who I was um, to the students I serve who oftentimes are unfortunate recipients of fatherlessness, right? And the fatherlessness they have is not by any merit of their own, sometimes not merit of the father, right? Like we know the systems at play that have been taking fathers out of the homes and using slavery, right? Breaking apart family units. I know that my, I can't ever replace a father, but I do know I can serve as some type of male role model figure to them, right? Especially for my little boys, right? Um, thinking about breaking apart things like toxic masculinity, right? Like. My boys who have so much pent up frustration, anger, all those things, right? I've told kids, right? You can't write this essay with all this pent up anyway. Let's talk about it, right? You can cry. Go ahead and shut the door. We can cut the lights off. That's fine, right? And giving them those opportunities, those are things that drive me, right? Because it wakes me up every day to go, hey, you know what? He might not have done the best on that test. He might have done well, but I see his progress. I see his growth. Right. And knowing that children trust me with their lives and families trust me with their children's lives, it pushes me and motivates me every day to give everything I can to the students I serve. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Dr. Dukes. I didn't want to be next. I, didn't. <laughs> I was about to say, okay, Andy with Duncan, we're good. <laughs> that motivation. Um, uh, um, let me one say to uh, Mr. Howard, you are absolutely a part of the school system. You are an educator. So uh, give yourself that title. Uh, that same talented 10th conference that I put on was with the help of two people who work with communities and schools. And then next year, they were not there and I could not put it on. That's how important it was to have them. So just know that the work you're doing is very powerful. Um, for me, uh, I can say that this passion for working outside of the classroom started with my realization that I um, just had a, a distaste for school. I, I, I excelled because my parents were not going to allow me to have anything below a B, but that if it was up to me, I wouldn't be involved uh, with the academic life, but that the outside curriculum really pushed me to say, okay, you got to have better grades if you want to be on a cheerleading squad, if you want to be on the dance team. You, you have, that was my academic motivation. Um, and that it really shaped me into the person I am now. I am a leader. I am a 
um, an emphasizer of student leadership and student advocacy because of those, those roles and those places. But the real passion now is after having a student um, lose his life in a senseless act and having so many students say, um, had we had a student council meeting that night, he probably wouldn't have went. Um, had we had our football game that we normally had, he, he wouldn't have went with those guys. Where I realized in this, in the works that I do, it became a life or death situation. That if I'm continuously putting in the work to keep you engaged and wanting you to come up to the school on a Saturday, on a Sunday, staying late, that the call of the street will become less um, and less powerful to what we were doing in the schoolhouse. So um, I, I know that the works that I did was powerful enough that I could help influence more school systems and not just my school, but I can talk to other people in North Carolina and, and let them know of the works that you really can put in when you put that um, extra touch on extracurricular activities and how that can really can increase that academic motivation for your students. Thank you so much, Dr. Dukes. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, for me, um, I know everybody says this is a hard job and there are days where it gets frustrating, um, but what keeps me going is what got me here. Um, I didn't get this motivation from my family. To me, it's just the same reason a flower blooms. I, I believe in service. I don't know why, I don't know how, I just love to serve. Um, the reminder that it's not about me is, is a great one. But, you know, I was watching TV last week and they had um, last week tonight and they were talking, uh, believe it or not, on national TV about US history. And they mentioned the Coddington slave game. And then they mentioned 1898. And all I could think was, I wanna be a part of why that's our past and not our future. And that involves talking about these things and addressing them in the present. And uh, I'm so humbled and honored to be able to do that, to talk about these uh, topics, to address them, to acknowledge them, and to help shape the generation that is going to realize our true future of, of unity and of tolerance and love. So that's my hope. That's what I hope to do. Thank you so much. And I would have to say that what drives me every day is leaving someplace better than where I found it. And if that means having someone feel better after a conversation, whether it's changing policy that changes the district, I'm driven by trying to make the world a better place. And I believe that that comes through collaboration. A lot of the conversations that we've had today, it's about working together. You know, Mr. Howard works for communities and schools. And I read a book by the founder of communities and schools, The Last Dropout, 20 years ago. And it changed everything about how I felt about education. And it was about the relationships. And I, I my students all came from places where nobody really believed in them a lot of times, and they didn't believe in themselves. And having that conversation to say, I'm here for you. I'm gonna help you get there. Here's the support and the resources. We're working on this together. It changed everything. And I believe that education is the true equalizer and people sometimes need a little help with that along the way. And being a part of the school system, um, I think that it can change everything for any student. And um, it's an honor, as Nelson said, to be able to stand here as a board of education member to be a part of that. Um, and I just am grateful to get to work with so many amazing people every day. Thank you. And last but not least, Principal Hill Black. She left me for last. Um, <laughs> so, you know, being a graduate of North Carolina Central, Eagle Pride, you know, our motto is truth and service. And I feel like, honestly, I live that every day. Um, it's about the truth of what needs to happen. It's about the truth of us bringing together collectively children, adults, and families. Um, I think I do this every day because once I realized that I do or do did still, you know, have an influence on children and in a classroom, that I wanted to extend that and extend those opportunities. Um, when I started teaching, I can remember my first year at Old Rolling Grice Middle School, stayed there 12 years. Um, by year two, I started to tell parents, I'm going to treat your children as if my child was sitting in the seat and, I'm going, and that's how I want him treated. And I have carried that with me through starting year 26. Um, there are students who are coming through the doors that I call my grand students because I taught their parents and you know, Miss Hill is still around. Um, but I feel like it's time for us to really get to work. You know, 
We've acknowledged that there is, there's some inequities. We've acknowledged that we have issues with diversity. We've acknowledged that you know there's so much that can be done. So oftentimes, if you see some of my Facebook feeds, I will say, we've got work to do. We have continuous work to do. And it's the knowledge of, I forgot who I heard say this, but we need the knowledge of our ancestors and our older generations and curve that with the energy of our 30 and unders um, because they have a new energy where they are self-advocating for themselves. They are self-advocating, they are advocating for a community. They are advocating for children. And if we take that collective genius, think about it guys, the collective genius of all that knowledge from our children as early as pre-K and kindergarten through high school, our college students, our elders in our churches and our local organizations we have a tough arsenal of information and creative genius we can use to continue the work around race and education and create opportunities where we don't have to have a freedom school that is embedded in one school for a little few kids in the summer, but a freedom school is embedded in curriculums across the United States. So um, I, I do this because I love it. I do this because this is what I do. I can't tell you why I wake up and come to school every morning some days, because some days I'll be honest, I don't know why I'm coming to Virgo every day. <laughs> I see those first few kids who come through that hallway or get off that bus or out of the car in the morning, whatever was is gone because it, it, you feel the love when you work in education and you love what you do on a daily basis, despite all the things that are maybe going on around you. So it's time for us to continue to do our work. It's time for us to continue to bridge opportunities from one school to our local school district to the universities, mine, UNCW, to the HBCUs and other PWIs that are educating all of our children. Um, and let's not again forget the role that community college plays and you know, change trajectory. That's what we are destined to do. And not that everyone has a bad trajectory, but let's help them define what it is that they want to do that's going to help them be totally successful. Thank you so much. Thank y'all for joining us. Uh, we would like to thank everybody who listened. Thank you, Velva Jenkins, who is our CEO at the YWCA. And thank you to Grace for assisting with tech and media in the background. Um, and we really appreciate everyone for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, Dr. Dukes, Stephanie, Principal Glenn, Mr. Nelson, Delvante Howard, and Mr. Marquise. I appreciate you all for sharing your thoughts on your passion with us. And we would like to see everyone for our next conversation on Talk on Race, and it is called Get Out the Vote. So thank you so much for your time. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.